Professor Fadwas Jurgis. Um, I've read his books, I've known about him, I've seen him on TV, but this is the first time I'm welcoming him in person. So it really is a wonderful occasion for us, and thank you very much to all of you for coming despite the very nice weather that we rolled out for him. Uh, professor uh, Jervis is a professor of Middle Eastern politics and international relations at the London School of Economics and Political Science at LSE. He also holds the Emirate Chair of the Contemporary Middle East and is the director of the Middle East Center at LSE. Um, in addition to this book, Obama and the Middle East, um, he has authored uh, a number of books uh, and uh, has contributed in pieces to the New York Times, the Washington Post, Newsweek, Foreign Policy, Foreign Affairs, and he has taught at Oxford, Harvard, Columbia, and was a research scholar at Princeton and the chairholder of Christian A. Johnson Chair in Middle Eastern uh, Studies. Uh, he's an expert on contemporary Middle East, and uh, which include Islam and political process, social movements, and mainstream Islamist movement. Um, this is a, a fascinating book, and I was, um, I read it, almost in one go coming from the Middle East uh, in seven and a half hours, which made the trip very easy, very quick, and sort of started scribbling on the margin. So I will have a number of questions when uh, we open the, your, after your presentation, when we open the session to uh, Q&A. Uh, Pavwaz is going to give us a synopsis of the book. He'll talk for maybe 25 minutes or 30 minutes about the book, and then we'll open the floor to your uh, questions, comments, and uh, some of you may have heard him uh, today at 11 o'clock on the Diane Reem show, and I must say that we are the number two event in this town. Number one was Diane Rim. We are number two. He's going to be at Politics and Prose, and I believe the Middle East Institute also. Uh, or I don't know. I got another I invitation no <laughs> from <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> so with that in mind, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the kind remarks. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it, um, it's an honor to be here. And I want to second also uh, my colleague and say thank you for taking the time and uh, attending this uh, talk today. Unfortunately, we have just one hour, as you know, and I really have so much to say. I'm an academic, I have to earn my salary. <laughs> so I, it, it really is very difficult for me to summarize uh, the uh, big points and also the details, the, the empirical record. Uh, but let me, before I talk about uh, the uh, Obama administration and the Middle East, let me say a few words about the context. The context matters a great deal. First of all, I know it's a cliche. Uh, this is not a polemical book, uh, and I, I have to say it because it's, it's really neither for nor against. I'm a historian. Uh, of course, I have my own biases and uh, predilections and what have you, but really I have gone out of my way to do justice uh, to the Obama presidency and the Middle East. Uh, and uh, I hope you take me to task if I have not uh, gone to great lengths to, the, to do justice to the presidency and the Middle East in the last four years. The second point, this is not just about the Obama presidency and the Middle East. You can't write a book about the administration and the Middle East. This is about American foreign policy and the Middle East. That is, again, I go to great lengths to contextualize the Obama presidency and the Middle East. Uh, uh, and this is, I don't need to tell you, um, I mean, 
one of my biggest chapters in the book. It's called America's Encounter with the Middle East, the Bitter Legacy, the Bitter Inheritance. Uh, and this, Barack Obama inherited truly um, a, a bitter legacy in the Middle East whose roots go back to the Cold War, uh, the rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union, culminating, of course, in the 9-11 uh, wars, particularly uh, the uh, Iraq war itself. Uh, I think also, just a few words about the context, I don't think it would be an exaggeration to say that when President W. Bush left office, uh, I think the United States uh, uh, reached its lowest point uh, in relations with that part of the world, the greater Middle East. That was really the lowest point in the history of relations between the United States and the greater Middle East. And when I say the greater Middle East, I'm talking about the Muslim world as uh, a whole. This is, this is very important. I don't have the time to talk about this bitter legacy that go back to 1947 and basically culminates in America's led invasion and occupation. But this particular legacy has become deeply entrenched, uh, I, I would argue, on both uh, sides. Uh, again, when, when Barack Obama came to office, I mean, here, uh, multiple wars on multiple fronts, hundreds of thousands of American troops battling in Muslim lands. Uh, the U.S. was engaged in a social engineering project uh, that really had little to do with its national security uh, needs and interests. Uh, America moral standing, not just in the Middle East, in the entire world, I mean, suffered a major setback, uh, in particular uh, torture at home and, and torture uh, abroad. Uh, even allies, I would argue, and, and foes, and, and I spend a lot of time on, on, on the historical chapters, the, the first two chapters, uh, basically question the whole idea that the United States uh, would act as a rational player uh, in order to guarantee international stability. Uh, not just, uh, I mean, uh, our enemies, even, even our allies, uh, states, major geostrategic, economic, uh, and political powers like Turkey began to question the whole idea that the United States really could be trusted to maintain a very fragile balance uh, of power. Uh, a revolt, truly, by 2008, 2009, a revolt was brewing, uh, in particular, not just in the Middle East, uh, against the unilateral use of, of force by the United States. Because after all, the United States was the most powerful nation, and here the United States was using and abusing the very institutions in a very unilateral uh, way. And the call became very vocal about the need to construct a new international system, a system that takes that basically not only uh, a, the unilateral uh, uh, nature of the balance of power, but multiple uh, sources and bases of power. Uh, the real costs, I, I know I'm simplifying a great deal, the real costs of the 9-11 wars, we, we can talk about the real cost, uh, three billion, trillion or five trillions. Um, I call the Al-Qaeda uh, the $5 trillion project, according to Brown University, and these are not my numbers. The United States has spent at least $4.5 trillion on the 9-11 wars. Uh, well, we can afford it, obviously, we're a, uh, but you're talking about, I mean, huge investments uh, uh, in, in, in the war, in the global war against terror. And, and also, we need to take into account the opportunity costs, not just uh, the money that we invested but while we were chasing, I mean, uh, roving bands of Al-Qaeda and militants in the valleys and wadis of Af Afghanistan and Pakistan, other places, the world was marching on. And geostrategic, economic, and global powers were really putting their economic uh, uh, houses in order and, and, and uh, creating the foundation of a new international uh, system. Um, again, the decline of the U.S. economy, of course, was not related directly to, I mean, the 9-11 wars, but the United States was in a horrible position when Barack Obama, um, just to give you an idea, at least how I contextualized the book when, when Barack Obama came uh, to office. Uh, uh, not only that, I mean, also you're talking about the fact that the very credibility, not only the credibility, the moral standing, the deterrence power of the United States. Uh, here, the United States went to Iraq in 2003, supposedly, um, we were going to plant Jeffersonian seeds in the heart of the Arabian desert, and then the domino theory effects will. Uh, yet, the very deterrent power of the United States suffered a major setback 
and people really began to contemplate the fact that the United States was not, after all, that powerful nation. That here you have, I mean, the so-called al muqawama resistance in Iraq could really somehow hold the United States at bay. Um, people really began to question the idea that the United States can be defeated, could be defeated. Um, and even, even the allies of the United States could be defeated. Uh, the, the, the idea was really basically began to resonate uh, in that part of the world that that was not as really, it was not an impossible uh, mission. And I think when the Obama foreign policy team came, I think I would argue based on everything that we know, they were fully aware of this particular bitter inheritance, they were fully aware of the vivid sense of America's relative decline as opposed to decline vis-a-vis -vis the rising geostrategic and geoeconomic powers uh, in the international system. And they also realized that the United States had overextended itself far beyond what its strategic uh, uh, interests were in that part of the world, the Middle East. Uh, uh, this was, I mean, I, I think a consensus emerged within the Obama foreign policy team that the United States uh, was too overextended, uh, was basically America's future does not lie in the shifting sands of the Middle East. America's future lies in the Pacific region and Asia, and the United States must basically reassess its priorities. Uh, uh, and I think in this particular sense, uh, they, they wanted to really make a clean break with the whole idea of the liberal use uh, of uh, a force unilaterally. I think Barack Obama was, was extremely uh, as, as you all know, I'll come back to, to the conceptual points about his administration, but the idea itself uh, was not only counterproductive, uh, very misguided as well, uh, because uh, the whole idea top-down uh, um, armies by Western uh, uh, powers uh, going to Muslim lands trying to plant Jeffersonian seeds, it defies logic and rationality. Anyone who knows a bit about the history of relations between the Western powers and the greater Middle East would have said, wait, wait a minute before you send your boots on the ground, because automatically in the minds and, and uh, of the people in that part of the world come the idea of colonialism and the whole bitter inheritance uh, deeply entrenched uh, in that part of the world. I think if there is, and this, I'm, I'm gonna come just five minutes about the conceptual, if there is one fundamental point that I stress in the book throughout, uh, is that uh, the Obama approach is deeply entrenched, deeply anchored in the dominant consensus um, about foreign policy in the United States. Um, uh, and I, one of the points I really highlight is that both the left and the right really misunderstood uh, Barack Obama foreign policy. Uh, that's the reality. Barack Obama, I mean, starting in 2006, he made it very clear that he was not a transformational president when it comes to foreign policy. He was a realist. Uh, time and again, he stressed that he was a realist in the spirit of Bush Sr. and JFK. He was not, he not only does not believe in the promotion of democracy, uh, he believes that foreign policy uh, is basically, uh, uh, belongs to the whole idea of the realist thinking, uh, collective security, mutual interests. His code word throughout from 2006, I don't preach to other nations. Uh, um, uh, he was not really, uh, in the, in the league of President Wilson, he does not believe in the whole idea of the, but rather believe that realism is the underlying principle, uh, should be the underlying principle of America's foreign policy uh, in that part uh, of the world. Uh, and uh, he also made it very clear that his goal really uh, was to return America's foreign policy to what it used to be before the new conservatives hijacked American foreign policy. That was uh, Barack Obama, uh, and that's why I say that Barack Obama deeply anchored in the consensus, in the paradigm, in the realist paradigm in American foreign policy, not just about the Middle East, but about international politics. Uh, uh, and what this, I mean, again, we simply once we understand this particular paradigm, collective security, mutual interests, uh, uh, the whole idea of promotion of democracy is not only misguided, but counterproductive to the idea, to the, also to the vision of democracy uh, promotion. Uh, another important point I, I, I highlight through the book, I wanna come back to the Middle East, just bear with me for a minute, I, uh, is that uh, the Middle East has never been a top priority for Barack Obama and his foreign policy team, never. Uh, uh, on the contrary, 
uh, as I suggested earlier, uh, there was a consensus within the Obama foreign policy teams that the United States had uh, um, overextended itself uh, far and beyond what its vital interests uh, uh, are in the Middle East. And they realized that basically the powers, I mean, it, it is uh, China, India, South Korea, Japan, Australia, this is really where the future is. Uh, and they wanted to shift American foreign policy priorities to, to the Pacific region and Asia, as opposed to really, uh, I mean, remain deeply engaged um, uh, in uh, the Middle East. Uh, but they also realized that they could not just pack and leave. That was not, I mean, again, you have hundreds of thousands of American troops, uh, tremendous resources and assets and engagement. I mean, uh, they wanted to, basically, Barack Obama wanted to, he and his team, to begin the process of mending the historic rift with that part of the world. Uh, begin the process, the whole idea of outreach. Many of us, really, the whole idea obscured uh, what really the Obama foreign policy priorities were. Uh, outreach was supposed to really begin the process of disengagement as opposed to really remain deeply engaged uh, in the Middle East. Uh, and what the idea, the, the mending, the rifts, with the Middle East really required uh, reducing uh, the, the, the military, the US military boots in that part of the world. That was a very critical point, um, in particular in Iraq uh, and Afghanistan, uh, helping to broker a Palestinian-Israeli uh, peace settlement. Uh, Barack Obama uh, was not the only president, but was one of the few presidents who basically linked a Palestine-Israel peace settlement to America's strategic interests. It was not just for the sake of peace, but it was also part of America's vital strategic uh, interest. A systemic campaign on the part of Barack Obama to really try to change the narrative about America and that part of the world. You know, the whole, uh, using his own story, his own personal story as a, a, a members in his family and a series of big speeches starting in Ankara, Cairo, Jakarta, uh, really tried, trying to uh, basically deal with this bitter inheritance to change the focus uh, uh, into different dialogue, different type of debate. And also test the waters with Iran. Uh, um, that is, again, while keeping the, the, the sanctions uh, against Iran in place, um, also he appealed to the Iranian leadership uh, uh, publicly in order to uh, give up their nuclear uh, program. And of course, uh, hammer away relentlessly against Al-Qaeda. Uh, this is an area, it was a strategic a priority for Barack Obama. His most important directive from day one, the idea is uh, an iron fist approach. Uh, dismantle Al-Qaeda and him using all uh, resources at his disposal uh, uh, in order to really uh, uh, destroy uh, uh, Al-Qaeda. Now we come back to the verdict. How much time do I have? You have, you have. <laughs> right, right. Uh, I've just really, I, I put on the table just some concepts to give you an idea of uh, how Barack Obama, his conception of the world and the Middle East, and to see really where are we today. That is how much, uh, I, I would argue that uh, the record is very mixed, and I, I'm not saying anything original. Uh, I think any fair analytical assessment of Barack Obama based on this bitter inheritance of relation between is will have to, it's mixed, and we have to look at, I, I don't believe you can say, I mean, a vision hole Barack Obama, the uh, Barack Obama presidency, and say success or failure. I think this is the wrong way to go. And this is polemical, does not take us anywhere. We need to talk about questions, issues, subjects, and see, you know, uh, uh, how he has done, and the, given the constraints on Barack Obama. I think, to my mind, one of Obama's most important political achievements has been the, the reduction of U.S. boots on the ground in Muslim lands, uh, basically drawing down from Afghanistan and pulling out American forces from Iraq, truly. This is one of the most important, I think, political achievements. Uh, this is not theoretical. Uh, some of us who know a bit about the Middle East, the presence of American boots on the ground in Middle Eastern societies and Muslim societies is insidious poisonous, almost really brought ruins to America's relation with that part of the world. Provided ammunition to militants and radicals who, uh, again, we can talk about why the presence, I mean, it's commonsensical, but I would be delighted uh, to uh, explain further 
why this is an important achievement. Uh, um, uh, and I, as you know, uh, despite the U.S. military's persistent efforts to maintain a sizable force in Iraq, I mean, they went out of their way. Uh, uh, the new leadership in Iraq that was put in place by the United States would not sign away the sovereignty, in particular by allowing U.S. forces, U.S. troops to have uh, legal uh, immunity from uh, 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 prosecution uh, in Iraq uh, itself. Uh, so despite the military's best efforts and, and Barack Obama, even though he wanted, he promised, he pledged uh, to the American people to bring American forces, he went along with the military. And I come back what really says about Barack Obama, yet uh, he had really, Barack Obama had no choice because the Iraqis did not, were unwilling to play uh, by the rules of the U.S. military. Uh, he had to bring, he had to bring American forces, all American uniform uh, forces uh, from Iraq. And this tells you a great deal. I think I'll come back to it. I mean, the book is, is subtitled, The End of America's Moment, the Beginning of the End of America's Dominance. What does it tell us really about the whole idea of America's dominance or predominance and what, what has happened? Why do we see signs of, of uh, the waning American decline? And this goes back the whole idea of 9-11 wars. The 9-11 wars really have the opposite results with their intended consequences, uh, undermining the very, not only America's credibility, but also America's deterrence power and the whole idea that the United States was the paramount uh, power. Again, Afghanistan, I would like, uh, you know that the surge in Afghanistan has not produced the desired effects. I don't need to tell you. Uh, you know uh, better than I do that the Taliban is not going anywhere, that the Taliban remains, um, remain a potent force and will likely play a key role in the future of Afghanistan, mostly for the worst, and unfortunately, as opposed to, unfortunately for Afghanistan, uh, because I don't think the Taliban um, have any vision uh, for the country. But the reality is, um, I mean, I think uh, American forces, most American forces will be coming home soon, in a year or two from Afghanistan and the Afghanis will be in charge of their own destiny and Afghanistan will uh, have to deal with its own uh, security questions. And I think one of the major points I take from the whole idea of bringing American troops home is that in contrast to his predecessor, I think Barack Obama and his foreign policy team uh, um, do uh, know the significance of pulling uh, American troops from Muslim lands and they realize, uh, again, I'm not saying anything original, that as long as American troops remain in Muslim lands, this will remain a critical uh, uh, challenge for the United States uh, in that part. It's a source of instability, a source of hostility. And there is a relative consensus in that part of the world that the presence of American troops is a great source, ideological source, for militancy and for extremism. And not to mention the fact that it's too costly. Uh, that's we, we, that the fact is, I mean, our presence, we, we're still paying about $100 billion a year in Afghanistan. Uh, I wonder whether, I mean, we can afford to pour uh, more, uh, uh, you know, 100 billions here and there, given the, 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 the nature of the uh, American economy. I think Obama's uh, outreach to Muslims um, has been largely beneficial. Uh, I don't think it has done any harm whatsoever, even though it's really fraught with contradictions and inconsistencies. Uh, I think there's a widespread belief based on everything we know that Barack Obama does not really mean what he says in that part of the world. There was a great deal, uh, great expectations when he came uh, to office, in particular the first nine months or so, that Barack Obama was different that he represents a breath of fresh air within the American political system, that Barack Obama really would like to deliver on the peace process. I think these promises, uh, people now realize that Barack Obama, and this is the, I'm talking about how people view uh, the president in the Middle East. Uh, they, don't, uh, they don't see him uh, as a transformational president. They don't see, they don't invest his words with any meanings. Because people are not, again, I don't need to tell you that they're, they're not dumb. They realize, um, I mean, uh, what, he, what he has done and what he has not done. And they realize it's, it's uh, uh, basically, uh, he has not been able to do what, what he pledged uh, to do. 
what's interesting, really what has happened in the Arab world in the last 15 months, the whole idea of the uprising and the revolts, that uh, people really have moved on. Um, the debate has shifted, truly. The debate in the Arab world and the larger has shifted from foreign policy to domestic politics, to uh, governance, to the whole idea of effective citizenship, uh, to uh, the question of dignity and bread and butter. And I think in, in a way, uh, Barack Obama has really helped to uh, indirectly in really uh, shifting this particular debate from what we call the cultural minefields of foreign policy to question of domestic politics and governance. Uh, 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 people realize that, I mean, you don't hear, uh, and to me, the reason why I, the, the whole idea, the end of America's moment is not a bad thing. The end of America's dominance could be a good thing for both that part of the world and the United States because people now, the United States is no longer seen as basically the player behind everything else, that the United States has been historically blamed for all the ills uh, and misfortunes that have befallen that part of the world. I mean, you don't hear the name of America in the same way used to before the, 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 the 15 months. The question now is on domestic challenges, on bread and butter, on jobs, on empowerment. Uh, uh, and I think, because I think Barack Obama in many ways, uh, he, he shifted, he helped to shift the debate. Of course, it's very difficult materially to document how he did so, but because the way even he responded to the Arab uh, uprisings over the last 15 months of course, he belatedly embraced, belatedly after a few weeks, uh, but he insisted on keeping a healthy distance. Uh, he insisted that people should take ownership of the revolts, and I think they should. This is essential. Uh, uh, it's their own, they must take ownership of it. And I think in this particular sense, uh, he did not really uh, uh, provide any kind. Of, uh, that's why if you go to Egypt or Tunisia or Morocco or at Yemen, uh, the United States is not seen to have either blocked or helped People march on, that, uh, and it's this really what we are witnessing in the region, and I would be delighted to answer any questions about the Arab uprisings, an area I know quite a bit about, uh, is that there is an awakened public opinion, an awakened public opinion that believes that somehow it's really the master of its own destiny. Um, and this, in many ways, I think uh, does uh, uh, help a great deal in the process of mending relations because it, the blame is no longer uh, on the United States uh, itself. Uh, uh, even though the contradiction is that while we embrace the uprisings in Libya and, and Syria and other places, we hardly say any a word about uh, Bahrain. Uh, even though we rhetorically embrace the uprisings, we have no initiatives, no material plans, no global leadership to really help transitioning societies, hardly anything at all. I mean, uh, if, you, if you listen to one of his most important speeches on May 11, 2011 at the State Department, it's a wonderful speech, a really historic speech, but yet uh, the, no concrete initiatives. And no one is talking about American money. We don't have the money. No one is really asking for it. Mean, there's tons of money there. You need, we're talking about global leadership. And I, again, I, I, I would be delighted to talk about the challenges because they are really overwhelming challenges. I mean. Um, 43% of the 320 million Arabs live either in poverty or below the poverty line. Uh, broken societies, institutional building, I mean, block by block. Uh, and the United States does not have to do it directly. The United States can really play a, an indirect role in helping a transi transitional society. We have not seen it. Uh, Barack Obama is engaged somewhere else, at home, uh, um, in other places. Uh, the Middle East is not really tells us a great deal that the Middle East is not, does not talk Barack Obama's uh, priority. Uh, and I, I say, uh, I think if uh, reducing uh, the U.S. troops from Muslim lands is Obama's greatest political, uh, I mean, achievement, Obama's greatest political failure is, again, the, the Palestine-Israel conflict. Uh, it truly is. And it tells us a great deal. You, I mean, this is, it's only, and it's not about rhetoric here, we're not scoring, I mean, I think, because for a simple, I mean, remember, this is a president that basically linked the resolution of the Arab-Israeli conflict to America's strategic part of interest. Uh, uh, I mean, the military as an institution basically linked a resolution of the Arab-Israeli conflict to the security, immediate security concerns 
of the American military and the security apparatus. The first telephone call the president ever made when he came to the first, on the first day, was to Mahmoud Abbas promising a settlement on the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Uh, he invested a limit, limited political capital in trying to uh, confront Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, uh, you know, the three confrontations, three major confrontations, and I don't have the time I, I, to really President Barack Obama caved uh, in the three confrontations and three uh, losses for Barack Obama. Uh, uh, what does, I mean, again, I, I want to simplify. Uh, I think it, it's not just a lobby. I don't buy the whole idea that somehow we can reduce everything to a lobby. It's nonsense. I think it, it's part of what I call the American political system as a whole, the dysfunctional American political system, which includes special interest groups, the Congress, um, a consensus, a, a, a consensus that has been formed over the last, since the late 1960s, uh, how the United States view that part of the world. And this particular consensus, Barack Obama, and I started by saying that Barack Obama really subscribes to the consensus. Barack Obama, uh, I mean, basically, uh, uh, you can't assess Barack Obama in terms of foreign policy except within the dominant paradigm in American foreign policy. Yes. He is genuine. Yes, he means it when he says he wants to help the Palestinians and Israelis broker a peace settlement. But Barack Obama, when he faced with major obstacles and challenges, when he really, his political capital was online, Barack Obama was unwilling to really go the extra mile to create a constituency for peace, to challenge the dominant consensus. Uh, uh, and what this tells us, I think, is also the institutional, the structural institutional continuity in American foreign policy. Uh, and, and this structural institutional continuity, you cannot understand the persistent failure on this particular front, and I, 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 I am one of these uh, researchers uh, who still believe that the Palestine-Israel conflict is the most fundamental fault line. Uh, uh, it truly is, despite all the nonsense, the ideological nonsense that we have heard since 9-11. It is the most fundamental fault lines in the region and in relations between the greater Middle East, the Muslim world, uh, and the Western uh, powers. Uh, and not just the, 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 the institutional constraints. I mean, I think also I find it difficult to uh, criticize Barack Obama. Barack Obama is timid, uh, 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 basically uh, very timid. He governs by consensus. Uh, uh, every time he faces major obstacles, uh, basically he often retreats. Uh, and it's not just on, on the Palestine-Israel conflict. Uh, I think his timidity speaks volumes about his personality as a decision maker. Uh, um, uh, the reality is that's who he is. Uh, uh, I want to leave it at that because I, I want to say a few words about Iran. Do I have five minutes? Uh, I mean, Iran, again, I don't need to tell you, uh, is really is a gamble for Barack Obama. Uh, uh, it, go, it could go either way. It could really, in a year, we might have a breakthrough the leadership, the Iranian leadership, uh, um, basically uh, makes the, the concessions that the United States and the Western powers, or we could find ourselves uh, at war uh, with Iran in the next year. Uh, and I would argue, again, you know this as, as much as I do, if not more, probably, and you do this much more than I, uh, I think uh, uh, the odds were against the Obama initiative to the Iranian leadership. And I want to just put my ideas on the table for you so you can really see where I, am, where I go with it. Uh, first of all, uh, I mean, he wanted to engage the Iranian leadership, yet he maintained the sanctions. He never, never wavered from basically reducing or lessening the, the, the sanctions against Iran. I don't know if you know this. From day one, he sent his top advisors to European capitals, making very clear, reassuring Western allies, and the WikiLeaks documents show very clearly that, that the United States will maintain sanctions, will maintain the pressure will maintain on the Iranian leadership while, of course, appealing to Iranian leadership to make, uh, I mean, to give up their uh, uh, nuclear uh, weapons. Uh, of course, he talked softly, but he never, I mean, uh, given up the iron fist approach uh, to Iran. Again, I don't need to tell you, he, he has faced stiff institutional and bureaucratic resistance in the United States, not just from the right, but even from within the Democratic Party, uh, stiff resistance. Uh, I'm talking about his top allies within the Democratic Party, uh, coupled with special interest pressure, uh, uh, tremendous overwhelming pressure. 
and Barack Obama, the intelligent politician, knows very well what it means. Uh, uh, he never educated the American public about the benefits of rapprochement with the Islamic Republic and the costs of, of confrontation, uh, because that would have required a great deal of capital. Again, the Middle East uh, is not, does not really top Barack Obama's foreign policy priorities. He had a full uh, agenda. And Israel and the Gulf states have exerted tremendous pressure from day one on Barack Obama in order not to really uh, engage the Iranians and uh, basically uh, uh, soften his approach towards Iran. I don't have the time to talk about, again, um, if you, I'm sure most of you have seen the WikiLeaks documents and what the, the Saudis um, and the various and, and the Bahrainis and uh, the United Arab Emirates, and we know Israel stand on this very, there's not, uh, Israel has been very consistent. And not only you don't engage Iran, in fact, you want to uh, use force if they don't really uh, uh, behave. Uh, it's not just, I mean, the, the institutional, bureaucratic, and special interest. The Iranian leadership, uh, unfortunately, uh, is neither uh, far-sighted nor united. Uh, they never trusted Barack Obama. I mean, I don't think uh, they have mastered the art of making enemies, of, of making fools of themselves, a fragmented decision-making process. Uh, they have never met Barack Obama halfway. They have never engaged Barack Obama. They have never realized the constraints under which Barack Obama was acting. Uh, uh, and that's why I think we, we in, the, in the last few months, the drums of war uh, have become uh, louder and louder. Uh, and, uh, and I think here, I think the verdict is that Barack Obama really has fought himself into a bind. Uh, that if the Iranian leadership does not retreat, Barack Obama had to go, has to go to war. That he has no exit strategy because basically uh, the reality is not only has Benjamin Netanyahu won the debate on the, on the Palestine-Israel peace process, but won the debate even on Iran. Uh, and, and, and he played these cards well. In the first meeting between Barack Obama and Netanyahu, President Barack Obama would not discuss Iran. He said the first priority is the Palestine-Israel peace process. We'll take care of that. Once we do that, we undermine the Iranian leadership because Iran uses and abuses the Palestine question. In the last meeting, Palestine, I don't, I don't know whether it was on the agenda, I doubt it very much was the question of reassuring the Prime Minister that the United States means business, that the President does not bluff, that the President, that our plans are in order, we have everything in place in order to uh, go to war uh, against uh, uh, Iran. Finally, uh, the war on terror. Um, and again, um, I mean, this is the record speak for itself. It's an iron fist uh, approach. Uh, he has been much effective, much more effective and much deadlier than his predecessor, despite all the nonsense that the neoconservatives have spoken about the war. Uh, in three years, he has done more damage to Al-Qaeda and whatever than, than in, in uh, seven years, the Bush team. But that's, that's a different story. Uh, um, uh, I mean, Al-Qaeda, you know, no longer exists. I mean, I, as a centralized organization, I, I, uh, it does not. Uh, uh, and, uh, of course, uh, Osama bin Laden, old fool, uh, uh, was almost penniless when he was an, an isolated. We, we, we know this for many years. I've written extensively. I, I had a book last year on the anniversary uh, of 9-11 called The Rise and Fall of Al-Qaeda. And I was one of the voices who have been arguing for many years that the worst thing to do uh, is to declare conventional war against Al-Qaeda, the non-conventional uh, uh, tiny entity. Uh, uh, I think Barack Obama uh, has used non-conventional means in terms of special operation forces, in terms of drone wars. Tremendous, though, technically uh, has done a great deal of damage. I worry a great deal myself. I really do about the blowback effects. Uh, don't, don't be sure that the blowback effects might not come to haunt us. And I'm talking particularly here about Pakistan, what the damage of the, the whole idea of the counterterrorism measures we tend to celebrate a great deal in the United States. We have a tendency for celebrations. But I want you to really reflect on the spillover effects, on the reverberations of America's counterterrorism effects on the whole debates of using force with no legal restraint, uh, the whole idea of the drawn at war, uh, 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 special operation forces, in particular in Pakistan. I'm not talking about Yemen. Yemen is an important, uh, I'm done in this, uh, 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 and I, my take on it, and this is, uh, it's one of the most 
beautiful thing we have learned about the Arab uprising is that really the Arab Spring dealt a fatal blow to Al-Qaeda's tactics and ideology. We knew all along this. We, we, have, we have barked for many years uh, that there are few takers for Al-Qaeda's ideology. That, that is, you fight Al-Qaeda using different mechanics and means. But what we have seen in the last 15 months really have reinforced many of our ideas about the huge divide that exists between Al-Qaeda's tactics and ideology and the uh, middle uh, opinion uh, uh, in the Arab world, different uh, world, different take, different aspirations, uh, different rallying cries. Uh, Al-Qaeda was uh, in wilder, you know, fairy tale, uh, the Arab world and, and millions of people were somewhere else. And my final, uh, and what I, uh, that does not mean that terrorism will not be with us. Uh, I'm not saying that. But it's essential not to invest terrorism with any kind of civilizational and cultural meanings. Uh, this is important for us, and we did invest terrorism after 9-11 with civilizational cultural meanings, as opposed to being a plague of globalization. As, as, as part of, we have to deal with it, of course, prevent it and, and, and cope with it. Uh, uh, and my, my conclusion really is that my final chapter is called In for a Penny, In for a Pound. Uh, I'm hoping that with a second presidency, that Barack Obama, the timid Barack Obama, uh, will basically uh, rise up and he will have the power of his convictions. Uh, his convictions to challenge the dysfunctional American political system, to try to create a constituency for peace, to really uh, be the uh, president that he could be one of the great American presidents in terms of American foreign policy. Uh, the jury is still out there um, and the record is mixed and I leave it as it is. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, let me open the floor <laughs> to your uh, question. Here, please, <coughs> in the front. Yeah. Just, uh, just, just wait for the mic. Yes. Hi, Mark Katz. Thank you for a great, great presentation. Uh, you know, I think it, it, it's very interesting. You, you've argued that uh, uh, Obama has, uh, his great contribution has been to take American troops out of Muslims' lands in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, now, of course, we've seen little, little sort of sidesteps into Libya, strange things going on with Yemen. We can send our missiles, not our men. And, of course, Iran is, uh, well, still a question mark. My question for you is um, with regard to Syria, and that is that what we've seen is that the Obama administration really has done very little with regard to the uh, Arab Spring uprising in Syria. And I'm just wondering, do you think, are there, just as there were costs of getting over-involved in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, is there a cost to the U.S. of not getting sufficiently involved in Syria? Or if, or if uh, what, 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 what could we do in Syria? And in that we're not doing much of anything, um, is that in fact you know, good for America's influence, bad for America's influence, bad for the Middle East? I'm just, what's your assessment of that, please? Is it one yeah. by one? Yeah, one. Uh, Mark, really, I... I know uh, a bit about Syria. I've been to Syria uh, a few times in the last year or so. And it's a very, very complex situation. I mean, I, I've been to it, uh, you know, I didn't travel on my American passport and crossed on my local ID from North Lebanon. So I, uh, it's a complex situation because uh, many of our premises have been based on uh, insufficient uh, information. I mean, and, and also many of our premises have proved to be mostly wishful thinking, I think. The first premise is that uh, Assad does not really have any social basis support inside Syria. I think uh, some of us who know a bit, unfortunately, is that his base ranges between 30 and 50 percent, really minimum 50 percent, probably uh, 50 percent, uh, probably more. Uh, we have thought that his security apparatus would collapse overnight and defect. In the first five weeks of the Libyan uh, uprising, almost 50% of the diplomatic corps and the security apparatus basically collapsed. Not even a single senior diplomat has defected. Very, very few, I want you to know, very few senior official, I mean, security apparatus has proved to be much more resilient and cohesive 
than we had thought. Uh, I, when I talk to Syrians, the bloody Christians are much more fanatical pro-Assad than the Alawites. Many Kurds and many Druze are as fanatical. They're terrified of the whole idea of the Salafi, Iraq, and Lebanon. Really, it's, it's the terrifying models, the whole idea. Look what has happened in Iraq. Uh, and they're willing to, to really fight for the regime. It's not just uh, uh, because their, their future, they think their future is online. Uh, so this is, you have a relatively cohesive security apparatus. You have a social base of 30% minimum. Uh, you have uh, basically a very divided opposition, very splintered opposition. Uh, I mean, I, I, when, when I hear this, the Free Syrian Army, it's just one among dozens uh, of, of opposition forces. Uh, the Security Council has been neutralized. Uh, I mean, I think one of the lessons that Barack Obama is that you don't go without legitimacy, international, the whole idea of realism is that you have to get a Security Council. You can't just go and, and shoot your way uh, because and also the whole idea that if you intervene, uh, intervene militarily in Syria, the country will most likely descend into all-out sectarian conflict. Most likely. It's already, Syria is at war. The question is not whether Syria, the question is will Syria descend and, and escalate into all-out war? That's the question. And what will be the implication to Lebanon and Jordan and other places? I think the Obama administration is absolutely correct to tread very carefully and try to use, uh, I mean, Remember, you say we're using the, we're, 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 doing, we're doing a great deal. We're waging war by other means. Literally, I mean, it's a war by other means. I mean, uh, economic war, financial war, uh, psychological war. Uh, the whole idea of psychological, because it was based on the premise that uh, it will crack open after a while. It has not, because it's, I mean, uh, the security apparatus, I mean, this is a regime that has been, I mean, uh, for the last 40 years, preparing for the worst case scenario. I, I really don't know what can be, I truly don't. One thing I know, the Assad regime will not be with us, uh, uh, I mean, in, in, in the medium term. The question is, how long will it take? Uh, one year, two years, three years? I mean, uh, my take on it is that really zero hours to five, six, seven years. Because I think the Syrian crisis, as you know, has been caught in a fierce regional cold war now. A uh, few of you know, how many of you know that Iraq now is much more vital to Syria than Iran? You don't hear about it, do you? Nur al-Maliki now is basically the Gulf states have alienated Nur al-Maliki. Nur al-Maliki believes that Turkey and Saudi Arabia are the ultimate enemies. But Tehran, Baghdad, Damascus is the lifeline of the Assad regime. Just go and visit and see the trucks nonstop. Go to Leb Lebanese borders and see the, how, how support is coming to Assad. So you have a regional cold war between the Iranians and the Iraqis and the Syrians on the one hand and the Saudis and the Gulf states and Turkey. And you have also uh, the Russian-American uh, bickering over Syria. The Russians uh, said, well, you, you'll never take, we'll, ne we'll never give you what, 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 what we did in Libya. Libya is, uh, and this is why the, 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 the whole idea when we say international legality, I think what, the United States, what, what NATO did in Libya. The Russians believe that the, the NATO violated the mandate that NATO went much beyond, and that's why the Russians are obsessed that we, we, you will not have, you won't have a security council. Go do it on your own if you dare. That's what we have. But to simply, I, I don't really know what can be done at this particular stage. And in particular, I don't know what can the United States do. Um, <clears throat> Evelyn Early, thank you very much, Fawaz, for a very cogent presentation. I'd like to go back to your comment about the importance of the issues of bread and butter and dignity. Uh, this is not the time for another Arab, uh, Arab awakening. This is not the time for another Gamal Abdel Nasser. But the secularists in the Arab uprising seem to have a little bit of trouble developing a very vibrant identity. Um, some of my friends have called it uh, global identity, maybe rooted in cosmopolitanism, et cetera, et cetera. Where do you see this part of the Arab uprising going uh, identity-wise, and what is the importance of cosmopolitanism and globalism in the future of the Arab uprising? Let's take another question. Yes. Uh, Christopher Rogers, I just wanted to play off the first question um, about Syria and move next door to Lebanon and, and ask uh, what you see uh, the Obama administration has any influence or, or um, leverage in, in Lebanon uh, to uh, push back against the, <coughs> let's say, Hezbollah, Iran domination, uh, having swapped out Syrian domination for Iranian domination. Um, and just a quick anecdote, I mean, I was there in, uh, before the elections in 2009, and uh, 
Vice President Biden visited, and I remember being in a taxi and uh, hearing the Hezbollah uh, spokesman warning the, U the U.S. to s stay out of uh, Lebanese affairs, and um, you know the prob probably the uh, elections in 2009 were disappointing for the March 14th movement. Um, basically, the same amount of votes as they got four years before. So, where do you see L Lebanon going? Sort of the spillover effects from Syria and other uh, Arab and Iran issues. Thank you. And uh, how much time do we have? Seven minutes. So short. Uh, so I'm, I'm, we'll I'm, get yeah, to this. Yes. I'm, I'm really uh, very worried about Lebanon. I mean, I, I think many of you, I don't know if you know that Lebanon really is in the eye of the storm. That Lebanon, as divided, is as divided as Syria, again, 50 50 percent. Um, Again, I don't need to tell you there are skirmishes and infighting in Lebanon. Uh, it's been going on for the last one year uh, in Tripoli and Akkar, and now uh, the skirmishes have reached Beirut. Uh, major, major divisions. It's not just between the pro and, and, and the anti-Assad, but also sectarian divisions. It's taken all. I mean, the greatest, really, I mean, what the Iraq war did, truly, it, it, it heightened and put fuel on this sectarian. It's, it's of course, it's, it's political. It, it's not, this is not cultural. I mean, Muslims are Muslims regardless, or Sunnis or, or uh, Christians. But in Lebanon, it's also taking on sectarian connotations. Um, and my fear is that if Syria descends into all-out war, Lebanon will likely break. Uh, uh, so far, I am, I am pleasantly surprised that Hezbollah has played, of course, they have sub verbally supported Assad and I think they have undermined, uh, uh, I mean, their standing, not just in Lebanon throughout the Arab world, because here you have Nasrallah more than once, uh, I mean, supporting Assad. Now he's changing his, his, his tune in the last few weeks, as you know. Now he's saying we call on both sides to talk, because he realizes that this is real, that it's not all armed groups, Salafi jihadi groups, that really there is an uprising, there is a political awakening uh, in Syria. Uh, but again, uh, Lebanon really is in the eye of the storm, and, and uh, I, I worry a great deal. I, I, I really do. Uh, I mean, it takes a spark. Uh, it, it's unbelievable how the situation explodes. I mean, you go in the morning, in the evening, you can't travel to Tripoli or Beirut just overnight. Um, I mean, you, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of, of, of weapons, and, and you're talking about this is, the, uh, it's bad. And I don't see, I don't think the United, this is a question for the United States. I think it's a question of the whole idea of what will happen in Syria and whether the political leadership in Lebanon will have the vision and the wisdom, which has never had uh, in the past, to really try to overcome uh, the uh, deepening sectarianism in the country. I'm not worried about Islamists. Uh, I, I, I really, I am not. Uh, I think, in fact, uh, I am seeing the Islamist, and I come back to the question of cosmopolitanism and identity. Uh, in fact, Islamists are being transformed before our eyes. Um, uh, Islamists, their engagement in politics basically is transforming Islamism. As you all know, mostly, most of them are centrists uh, and, and, and demo Islamic uh, Democrats. They subscribe to the political, uh, the rules of the political game, the institutionalization of the political process. They accept the whole idea of pluralism, uh, the whole idea of citizenship, as opposed to you know the sovereignty of God, which used to be hakamiyat uh, Allah. Uh, today, it, the whole idea is that the will of the people uh, is the foundation of, of legitimacy. Uh, most of them, with the exception really very few, call I mean for Islamic states. They call for civil state, and really what secular state, because the term secularism has terrible connotations in the Arab world. So they call for civil, al-dawla al-madaniya, as opposed to al-dawla. But what it really means is that, uh, and once they institutionalize the political process, once this paradigm is that every, all the wars and battles will take place within this framework. The question is not whether, I think it's the wrong question to say that whether Islamists are liberal or democratic. They are neither. The question to me is whether Islamists are willing to institutionalize the political process and willing to play by the rules of the game. Because, I mean, it's, the institutionalization comes before liberalism and democracy. Even the American founding fathers were not liberal. But once they institutionalize the political process, then, I mean, liberalism uh, uh, and democracy and everything else. And the reason why I'm hopeful, because also they're becoming more constituency uh, driven as opposed to uh, ideological driven. 
Uh, and this is a major, major shift, whether you're talking about the Muslim Brotherhood or al Nahda in Tunisia or Adel al Hassan in, in Morocco and, and whatever. So the Islamists themselves now are being transformed. And they realize that the, the voters that basically did not really vote Islamist in because they want Islamic Emirates, voters basically wanted a clean break for the past, the failed authority in the past. They trusted the Islamists. I mean, to put it in American terms, Islamists have mastered the art of local politics. Uh, and that's why they've done as well as they have. And they will be voted out in the same way they're voted in if they don't deliver the goods. Let me come to the whole idea of secularists and- Unless they are like Algeria and Greece. They, they, they really, <laughs> you see, it also, depends, it also depends on how they come to power. They were voted in. They are now, they go, and you see what the Muslim Brotherhood doing now. I mean, they're going house to house, trying to call on Egyptians to vote to Mohammed uh, Morsi, the presidential candidate. They realize their constituency 18%, yet they had almost 42%. Liber the liberal, and it's a sad story, truly. What's sad, if you go to Egypt and Tunisia and other places, you talk to liberal-minded. Uh, they're, they're, they're sad and, and because they basically spark and trigger the revolt, yet the Islamists are bearing the fruits, I mean, uh, of the, and the reality is because, I mean, if you go and talk to liberal-oriented and minded and, and secularists, uh, they're seen as elitist. Uh, I mean, divorced from the aspirations and fears of the people, sitting in their air-conditioned offices in Cairo and Tunis and Algeria, never ventured to the countryside, never have any blueprints, uh, uh, and, and this is a reality. They spend most of their time on Al Jazeera and Arabi and everyone else talking about the fact that they are better, that don't vote for the Islamist state. I mean, in Tunisia and Egypt, the liberal-minded activists, basically their campaign was anti-Islamist as opposed to really having concrete uh, 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 blueprints. Um, I hope out of this particular, I mean, rout, they'll stop whining and buckle up and really to develop a base, to really connect, because my take on it is that Islamists will have to deliver the goods uh, in the same way that Indonesians voted for Islamists in 1999. They did not really vote for Islamists in the second round. Uh, and that's why this is the beginning. We should not take the elections that have taken place in the Arab world as really a yardstick, a measurement of how the Arabs will vote. Uh, they won't vote for the Islamists in the second round if they don't deliver the goods. And my take on it, and I, I said it really, I say it with a heavy heart, I doubt it very much if the Islamists can or could deliver the goods because of the enormity of the challenges, the enormity of the challenges. I, again, wh what can I tell you? I mean, in Egypt, Egypt is, is bankrupt, literally bankrupt. Uh, there are no institutions. Uh, uh, this is a society, I mean, it, it is, uh, how, and also because of the paucity of ideas that Islamists have not had the time have not theorized, have not really conceptualized any particular programs about economic. I mean, I just had a piece called The New Capitalists, The Political Economy of Islamists. If you ask them, they basically believe in free market economics. That's the extent of it. But beyond that, there is nothing there. So the identity, the, the, the liberal-minded and secularist must really listen and listen to the aspirations and the fears and the hopes of the people. And then they, they, they can develop their own uh, uh, I mean, set of ideas. Uh. If you take the example of Iran, the constitution was drafted after the referendum that brought the Islamists to power so that they won't be voted out of power. What sort of guarantee do we have that this would not happen? I'm not talking about oh, Tunisia. No. Tunisia yeah, is an yeah. What about? Uh, the Arab world is not Iran. In fact, Iran is the wrong example to measure the pulse of public opinion and political, and I'll say a few words why I think for the question, very, very important one, uh, truly. In fact, Iran is seen as a failed model by Islamists. Iran is a failed, the failed Vilayat al-Faqih is seen is one of the reasons why most Islamists have given up on the whole idea of a dawla Islamiyah or even because they realize what has happened in Iran. They realize, uh, really, they, they, I mean, if you, if you want, if you really want a, an example, an inspiration, Turkey is the example. I mean, throughout the region, in Jordan, in Tunisia, in Morocco, in Egypt, in, Turkey is seen as an example because Turkey is a state that is seen as, in terms of authenticity, identity. It's a Muslim state, it's a democracy, and it's a successful economy. And that's why, I mean, most of the Islamists 
In fact, look at Iran. It's, it's, it, this is something, I mean, they're terrified of the Iranian mob, literally terrified. Uh, they also, there is no Ayatollah Khomeini in the Arab world, luckily for the Arab world. There is, there is no mullah, there, there is no cleric, uh, basically, who's, uh, that's a reality. Uh, you have political forces now really, I mean, debating and fighting in order for, I mean, for, for dominance and influence. And the Islamists know very well that basically the voters voted them in, not because they promised to deliver heaven, they promised jobs, growth, and bread and butter. And also the most important point is that checks and balances, checks and balances. The Islamists in Egypt know very well if they miscalculate, they realize, I mean, the whole history uh, about the relationship between the military and the Muslim Brotherhood, what happened between 1954, 1952 and 54. I mean, I, there's no time written a book on it, on the, 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 the uh, clash, the confrontation between uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser, the Arab nationalist, and the Islamist. So checks and balances, voters and constituency, and the Islamists have moved on. They really look at Turkey as a model, as an inspiration, where you really marry authenticity with economic and liberal idea, pluralistic ideas, as opposed to liberal. Uh, please uh, join me in thanking uh, our speaker. We have run out of time.